So before we start, I wanted to just say the uh, the song uh, Out of My Hands that Shelly played today, that was like a really good lay down song. Really good for uh, our message today. Um, our message today is called Smallness uh, Part 2A, because it's also going to be a multi-part series, uh, called Disgraced and Humiliated. Shabbat Shalom to everyone here. Time for another sermon on smallness, but a different aspect of it. Smallness is something that affects everyone. Whether you realize it or not, it's that knocking at your door, telling you that you can do so many things that go against God. A slight knocking telling you about your past pains and regrets. A simple reminder about something you did in the past that you were embarrassed about. Something that someone knew you did and used it to point and laugh at you or to tell a story about you to make you feel small and make them seem like the know-it-all in the conversation. Have you ever been shamed or disgraced? Have you ever had a, a friend, a family member, or even someone you thought was a complete stranger bring up a memory that you thought everyone got past? The burning sensation or color come into your cheeks as they retell a story of you doing something wrong or simply a mistake that was made to distress or not knowing better. Well, this reminder truly comes from smallness, or it pushes you into smallness. We are called to be encouragers. We are called to lift up others, not, not put each other down. We are all beloved believers of Yeshua, but one time or another, we may have done this put someone down, or said, you are not worth my time, or thought of something really funny about that person, and told them it, thinking they would laugh. Well, you just pressed a pain-filled button. Now, just uh, a little reference to Charlene's uh, sermon on smallness as well. Smallness is something that we really, really need to lay down. That's also why I brought attention to the song. It's such a good message. It's something that affects everyone. Talking to someone about your pains may feel good, but turning it over to God gets rid of that pain, that embarrassment, that disgrace, and that humiliation. He will take it and send it into the sea of forgetfulness. Then you ask for that gift of forgiveness. Confess that unforgiveness of others and yourself. Forgive yourself and others and lay, it, lay down that bitterness that is trying to dig a root into your soul. This is the reminder that God can take away our pain and can help us through every situation, no matter how big or small, no matter how hum humiliating or shameful. He is our God, and He will help us in every situation. Now that we have the, our pain-removing and life-giving gift set before us, we will now deal with volume two with smallness. Oftentimes, when a person has been publicly disgraced or humiliated, they will go and run and hide. They will play on their own and be a loner or someone who is quite lonely. They will often, co oftentimes collect weapons to be their defense, collecting items such as swords, knives, spears, guns, tanks, or nuclear bombs. They will also use propaganda to defend themselves, and the smaller they are, the more propaganda they produce. I wonder if we have a couple of examples in our leadership nowadays about that. I'll give you a little insight on myself. I did this a lot. I played outside a lot, away from everyone else. Running around fight in a field fighting imaginary monsters, not wanting to be around anyone. And I think fondly of these memories, but smallness is rooted deeply within it. Why did I not want to be around others? Why did I gravitate toward having a stick or some kind of weapon with me? The root? Smallness. When we are disgraced, we are made to feel so small inside. We then put a reliance on the physical. We don't or can't see how God can help us. We put our trust in a weapon rather than in God. Sometimes, a joke can do that to you. Being the joke, or someone using a joke to poke at a memory of the past that had shamed you. 
It brings you back to that smallness, brings up that pain, which then leads you into that smallness once again. This leads you into bitterness. We find at times that these jokes can be used to disgrace and humiliate you. And if they can make you bitter with that joke, you will approach them with fake enthusiasm. I personally can come up with a few memories of being joked at and trying to laugh it off rather than stand up for myself, rather than see myself as worth standing up for and hiding my bitterness. Being a part of the laughter so the, humili or so the pain will end sooner rather than stand up for yourself. This gr disgrace and humiliation Sorry, this disgrace and humiliation comes, or that comes from this, pushes you further and further into smallness, where pains that have been hiding come out, or it renews that pain you have felt in the past. It throws your godly identity away and tries to claim you with a fake identity. This is the bitterness, and this bitterness, if not dealt with, will stay with you your whole life. It will lead you down the pathway of malcontentment, which results with you not even liking when someone else is being loved, that you can't even handle a child getting a hug or someone being comforted. Simply stated, I should be com comforted, not them. I deserve love from them, not that child or person in pain. This includes people who are being promoted, and the bitterness stating, why are they being lifted it up and not me? Why, does, why do they get something good and not me? This is what being disgraced and humiliated leads to. A deep bitterness and resentment for everyone around you. This is why we need to lay it down. This is why many times in the Psalms, David talked about praising God in the hard times. That God was his refuge and shield. God was his rampart and fortress. He put his whole trust in God gave his pain to God, and walked away from that bitterness. Yeshua stands there with open arms, wanting to take your pain away. He wants you to not walk in bitterness, but to show love and compassion. When you lay down this smallness and get rid of it, you could sense the pain in others, and can truly, heartfelt fully, encourage them. You empathize with their pain. You see where it is coming from and you can give them that heartfelt encouragement. A hand, or light, in the kingdom of darkness that is trying to, that is reaching down to pull them out of that deep pit that was made especially for them. For them. To show them God's love and truth in, of his kingdom. Remember, we are loved, so deeply and vastly loved by our Heavenly Father. He wants us to bring our pain to him to give us his gift of love and to be corrected. When we have a fear of, our, of past humiliation and disgraces, we begin to lie to others or lie about situation or about the situation. We do this to neutralize whatever was brought up, to hide the pain and to make ourselves believe the lie so we don't feel it anymore. We begin to live in that lie to protect ourselves using this lie rather than Yeshua as our shield and rampart. Down this pathway, hidden anger will come out and create stress points in our lives. This will cause little things to set us off. Someone accidentally bumps you on a bus, a car cuts you off because they missed their turn, your friend tells you to not have a good day as a joke, but it reminds, me, reminds you of a past memory. Little things all over the place that became stress points. All of these factors and stresses prematurely age you, or give you gray hair. And yes, I'll use myself as an example. I'm 26, and I already have gray hair. <laughs> At least you have hair. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks to Yeshua, my life and youth and vitality is restored, and I am healed and made whole. Something we should claim every day. Disgracing is not only making you small, it also makes you feel insignificant. This insignificance always builds hopelessness. It makes you feel as though you can't say or do anything right. This insignificance makes you feel like the downtrodden spoken about in the Psalms, or being looked down upon by others. 
David dealt with a lot of people looking down upon him, but he chose to keep his eye on God, to keep his focus on God. A few examples of people putting insignificance on you, or you putting it on others, is when you go to give someone a hug and they don't even respond, they're telling you that you are insignificant in their eyes. When you say hello to someone and they don't respond, or even acknowledge your existence, or when you help someone and they don't say thank you, or they don't acknowledge that you assisted them in any way. These are all signs of insignificance. And this ins insignificance disgraces you. It puts smallness on you and says that you are replaceable and disposable. That they don't need you or anyone and that you are just another faceless person in the way. Isaiah 49 verse 5 to 6 states, now, so now says Adonai, who formed the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, to gather Israel back to him. For I am honored in the eyes of Adonai, and my God has become my strength. So he says, it is too trifling a, a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. So I will give you as a light for the nations that you should be my salvation to the end of the earth. Though people may see us as insignificant, this is not, although this is how the God we serve sees us. He sees us as a light for the nations. Nothing is too trifling for him. Nothing is too small for God. We are to be servants or slaves to righteousness. He will lift us up as kings. We are part of his kingdom. We need to remove this pain and see that this smallness is harming us. When we use this sin to make us big, popular, or acceptable to the world, we are making God small and Satan big. This is a lay-down item. We need to be encouraged while working through this topic. It is hard to deal with. How can a small thing be so big? We all know about narcissism, how people that are narcissistic treat others and see others as beneath them. Well, when you look down upon others, you are seeing yourself as big. But then, you are seeing others as small. You look down upon them. You see yourself as worth more, your time as worth more. That people are simply in your way, and if they don't do as you tell them, you will replace them. That the people around you are replaceable and disposable. That if you aren't sucking up to them, or kissing their ass, you are replaceable or disposable. When you are stuck on the receiving end of that narcissistic behavior, you are told that you are small and worthless, that you are good for abusing, that you can be taken advantage of, that you can be blamed for all their problems, that you are their scapegoat or the source of their pain, and that you can be shamed by them. Just as an example of this, You'll find this a lot in very religious places. You can't be a Christian. You didn't kiss my ass enough. You didn't compliment me on boasting about how good I am. You didn't tell me that I am perfect and that you are a sinner. This smallness has an effect of taking you down. And now for a hard point. People who were deeply shamed when they were very young are more prone to becoming narcissistic. They will experience a very traumatic event or deep pain which has caused them to become bitter and to think of themselves and others as insignificant. But when they do that, they come up with a mentality of, I'm hurt, so I get to hurt you. If the narcissistic person can hurt you, he is using that, that hurting others as his defense. And this defense is used to keep from dealing with their own trauma. This aspect of smallness brings in the thought process of how to make others small so they can feel big, strong, and superior. They want to feel superior, so they will make you feel inferior. This is why they are always looking at you for abusing, beating down, or taking advantage of. You are an obstacle in their way that they want to manipulate and use to their advantage, and they gain satisfaction and pleasure out of making you small as it makes them feel like they're big, strong, and superior. 
You can find many examples of this, especially with David and Goliath. Goliath talked down to David, calling him nothing but a boy, nothing but a dog. But God was on David's side. With Saul, when the Spirit of God left him, he felt super small and rejected. This caused him to want to destroy whoever had the Spirit of God. Gideon considered himself small, and the whole nation small, because they were being constantly attacked. This is partially why he needed proof from the angel of God that was with him, and he tested the angel twice. Zacchaeus was also considered a small man. We can see right there with him being labeled as a short man. He had the label of smallness upon him. He was a tax collector and used that to make others small and force them to pay their taxes. But his faith in wanting to see Yeshua brought him the freedom that he needed to leave that smallness behind. Psalm 37 comes to mind when going over this smallness topic. Words of encouragement which can help us get out of this dark pit. Now, I'm going to read the whole thing because it's, I could not break it apart. It is such a, a good psalm for this smallness. Do not fret because of evildoers, or be envious of them who do wrong. For like the grass, they soon wither and fade like a green herb. Trust in Adonai and do good. Dwell in the land, feed on faithfulness. Delight yourself in Adonai, and he will give you the requests of your heart. Come, or commit your way to Adonai. Trust in him, and he will do it. He will bring out your vindication as light and your cause will shine as noonday. Be still before Adonai and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over one prospering in his way, over one carrying out wicked schemes. Put away anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to doing evil. For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for Adonai, they will inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Yes, you will look at his place, but he will not be there. But the meek will inherit the land, and delight in abundant shalom. The wicked plots against the righteous, and gnashes his teeth, or at him with his teeth. Yeshua laughs at him, for he sees his day is coming. The wicked have unsheathed their sword, and have bent their bow, to bring down the poor and needy to slay those whose conduct is upright. Their sword will, pe will pierce their own hearts, and their bows will be broken. Better a little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, while Adonai upholds the righteous. Adonai knows the days of the blameless, their inheritance endures forever. They will not be ashamed in an evil time, and in days of famine they will be satisfied. For the wicked will perish, and the enemies of Adonai will be like the beauty of the fields. They will vanish, vanish like smoke. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous is a gracious giver. For his blessed ones inherit the land, but those he curses will be cut off. From Adonai a man's step, man steps are made firm, when he delights in his way. Though he stumble, he will not fall headlong, for Adonai is holding his hand. I was young, and now I am old, yet I have never seen a righteous one forsaken, nor his children begging for bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, so his offspring will be a blessing. Turn from evil and do good, so that you may live forever. For Adonai loves justice, and does not abandon his godly ones. They will be preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The Torah of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, seeking to slay him. But Adonai will not leave him in his hand, or let him be condemned when judged. Wait for Adonai and keep his way, and he will exalt sorry, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked, ruthless man flourishing like a leafy tree in native soil, but when he passed, he was no more. 
Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Notice, the man of integrity and watch the upright. For the man of shalom has a future, but the transgressor will be destroyed altogether. The future of the wicked will be cut off. Yet the salvation of the righteous is from Adonai. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. Adonai helps them and delivers them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. People who are in smallness are prone to hide in the darkness. They want to keep dark secrets and hide their pain in the darkness. This scripture pulls you out from that darkness. It tells you that there is hope in Yeshua, that there is freedom in Yeshua, that there is no other source of freedom. Understand that, this, that though this smallness fights against you, you can lay it down. You can bring it before God. You can get rid of that pain and become who you truly are meant to be. Not some person being beat down by others and smallness, but a true co-heir with Yeshua, God's own son or daughter, a blessing to others and lights to this world. This is part one of the second aspect of smallness. This curse cripples many people and affects you in the oddest of ways. Lay it down. Lay down that pain. Lay down that bitterness. Ask for the gift of forgiveness and turn over your anger. God will lead you to paths of righteousness when you keep your eyes focused on Him. Blessings, peace, and shalom be with you all. And remember, you are bigger on the inside. And a side note here, dark secrets will cause us to speed up or skip over harder topics. If you ever notice me speaking over this and I started speeding up, topics are kind of hard to lay down and it's hard to work through these things. Especially ones that have anger involved. I recommend everyone review the teachings, Dark Secrets. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you.